Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you here this Sabbath in Santa Clarita. I, uh, I never come here without seeing something that you have done with excellence. And I must compliment those who are responsible for this amazing Christmas display. It is absolutely beautiful. And I also want to thank you for what you're doing for these homeless families. Uh, uh, the last time I was here, you were talking about that project as well. And if you were to read Romans 13, you would see that in loving, we are keeping the commandments. And so I, I just have to tell you that I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you have a great heart. Uh, it is my custom before preaching to talk to my Father in heaven, and so I just invite you to join me uh, as I pray. Father in heaven, what an amazing and loving God you are. Yes. In every topic that we explore in your word, we see more and more evidences of the relationship that you want for us to have with you and the awesome love that you have lavished on us. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse my heart and the hearts of each one who will hear this message, that your Spirit may speak to us clearly. May you help me to clearly proclaim the message that you have entrusted to me to share this day. And may each of us be drawn closer to you so that we might share your goodness with others and hasten the day of Christ's return. Yes. We thank you now for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now along this time of year, we have, I'm sure, looked into the events leading up to the birth of Jesus. And I don't know whether you covered the announcement of the angel to um, Zechariah that John would be born or not, but even if you didn't look into it in this season, you are aware, or I hope you are aware, of the importance of the ministry that God gave to John. If you're not familiar with it, read it in Luke 1. Zechariah was a priest of uh, the tribe of Levi, of course, so was his wife Elizabeth, and therefore so would be John. And as a Levite, John could have followed his father in that type of sanctuary worship, but God had a special function in mind for John. He was to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. He was to be the one who would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children before the day of the Lord arrived. Scripture had predicted these things in Malachi uh, chapter 3 and also in Isaiah chapter 40. But John had been preparing for his ministry all of his life. And I've puzzled over why it is that John would spend his lifetime in the wilderness. God does not choose us to live a monastic life, to just be a contemplator of heavenly things. God wants us to be instruments through which God can impart his love and teachings to those who dwell in darkness. So why would John 
spend the first decades of his life in the wilderness. I spent a considerable amount of time thinking about that. You can read about the voice in the wilderness in Desire of Ages, and there are some excellent points there, but there is no divine inspired record of all of the things that happened to John in his formative years. And so I have contemplated what could it be that John was doing. I would imagine John would have become extremely familiar with the scriptures. The Jews of today refer to it as the Tanakh, sometimes the Torah, or we call it the Old Testament. To John, it was just the scriptures. It was the words God had entrusted to his people through his servants, the prophets. And we have these very, very convenient devices called a book or a codex. Not Kodak, codex. And we can purchase them at a variety of different stores. There are places who give them away for free, and we have easy access to the Word of God. It was not such in the days of John. Everything would be handwritten and therefore highly valuable, expensive because of the hours that it would take to write it. And the scribes were so careful that if they made a mistake, they would discard what they had written and start again. I tell you, it would take me the rest of my life to finish one book, much less the whole Bible. I cannot write without making mistakes. Even the notes that I have here for my message today are scribbled out in places. So having the scriptures would be difficult. And so in my mind, I was thinking, how would they do this? And I thought, this is speculation, that perhaps families who had a scroll, a book, or a portion of the book would treasure it, but perhaps loan it on an exchange basis with other families. And so I pictured John spending these formative years not just sitting in the wilderness contemplating heavenly things, although I'm sure he did some of that, but I think he was spending a great deal of time in study. I think God chose him to have a double PhD a doctor of theology, and a doctor of ministry. One means you know the stuff. The other means you know what to do with the stuff that you know. So then what would John do with all of this knowledge? How did he get to be the ones, the one that the people were streaming from the cities to listen to? You don't get that kind of instant <coughs> sorry, you don't get that kind of instant success. So I picture John as working along major routes of travel. As people would pass by, he must have engaged them in conversation, asking questions, giving thought-provoking ideas until people came to think of him as a pretty smart guy. And as his notoriety, in a good way, not notorious, but renown is a better word, as his renown came to be known by the people, more and more people would come out to meet him. He was six months older than his cousin, 
Jesus. By the way, Jesus must have been from Mary's side of the family, a Levite. You, I don't know how you could have a cousin who wasn't in the same tribe as you are. So Jesus got his priestly side from Mary and his Judah or kingly side from Joseph, but more particularly from the Father in heaven. But during those months, perhaps year or so, before the announcement of Jesus, John came to be highly known and respected among the people in Judea. Now, it says that he lived in the wilderness, and the wilderness of Judea, maybe you have zero idea where that would be. So in your mind, I'd like for you to picture kind of the stereotypical view of the promised land. And if you will allow me to illustrate on my invisible screen right here, to the left side, you would have the Mediterranean Sea. All right, you picture that. Now, kind of in the middle and at the top, there's a small lake we think of as the Sea of Galilee, right? And coming southward from the Sea of Galilee, there's the Jordan River, and then at the southern end of the Jordan River, there's this giant footprint-shaped sea that's called the Dead Sea. Now, if you can kind of envision that, Jerusalem would be on the west side of that Dead Sea, Jordan River area, and just a little bit away from the equivalent of where the Dead Sea would start. Now, the wilderness would extend on that north end of the, excuse me, the north end of the Dead Sea and the south portion of the Jordan River on both sides of the Jordan at extending west and southwest on the west side of the Dead Sea. Now, at least you have somewhat of a general idea where that would be. But because of its somewhat proximity to Jerusalem, many people would pass that way. Of course, now if you lived in the northern area, not so much. But there was still a great deal of traffic through that region. And John was there talking to these passer passers-by. John must have also been very familiar with the prophecies of Daniel. And the reason he took all of this time in study is he didn't just read it and say, yeah, I've heard that story, I know that. He must have also understood that Messiah, the prince, would appear at a certain time in history. And he was aware that that time was quickly approaching. And so with that preamble in mind, I'd like you to turn to the book of Matthew in chapter 3. We are now at what verse 1 calls those days. In those days. This is after Jesus has grown up, after John has grown up, and it is the days shortly before the coming of the Messiah. Please don't confuse the birth of Jesus with the coming of the Messiah. Jesus was born 5 or 6 B.C. in Bethlehem, but he was not yet the Messiah. He was promised to be the Messiah. It's like the prince is promised to someday be the king, but until he is coronated, he is not yet the king. 
So in Jesus' growing up years, he was Jesus of Nazareth, who was promised to be the Messiah, but he was not yet the Messiah. Because does anyone know what Messiah or Christ means? The anointed. Very good. And until Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, he was Jesus of Nazareth only. It was not until he received the Lord's anointing that he became the Messiah. Promised to be, but not yet. So it's in the days previous to that that John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, there are two things there that we have to spend a little bit of time discussing. First of all, what does it mean to repent? Now, I erroneously believed in the past that to repent is to do an about-face, to just turn around. I have been going this way, and now I turn, and I'm going this way. That's partially true. But the word in its Greek origin means more specifically to think differently or to change one's mind. So here's John in the wilderness saying to the people, folks, you need to change your mind. You need to adjust your thinking. <coughs> From the text, we saw today there were some who believed we're the children of Abraham. What else do we need? We are the descendants of the great father Abraham we're in. There are a great many people who believe that membership in the Seventh-day Adventist church is for them that kind of an assurance. Because I am a member of the church I've got it made. And you remember in the scripture this morning, John says, don't think you can say we're the children of Abraham, because God can make children of Abraham from these rocks over here. It is not based on ancestry, and it is not based on membership. And so this message of John applies to us, too. John says, first of all, you have to understand that your thinking is partially incorrect. Not totally incorrect. He's not saying you're dead wrong. No. He's saying, but you need to modify, you need to change, you need to enhance your way of thinking. Think differently. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, I want you to consider some of the things that Jesus had to say about the kingdom of heaven. In John 18, verse 36, Jesus is before um, his judge in his so-called trial, Pontius Pilate. And he is being asked by Pilate, are you a king? Is it true? Are you a king? If so, where's your kingdom? And Jesus' answer was, you know this, but it's John 18, 36. My kingdom is what? Not of this world. So in other words, if we want to understand the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven... It's not a normal kingdom in the way that we think of kingdoms, a territory governed by a king. What else did Jesus have to say? He said in Luke 17 and verse 21, you don't find the kingdom by carefully searching for it. You don't need MapQuest to lead you to where it is. You're not going to find it on Google Earth. 
Why? Because the kingdom, <coughs> sorry, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Now notice, this is an important factor here. It is not that we are in the kingdom. It's not so much our citizenship, but that the kingdom is in us. It is not in our citizenship, but in our relationship. The kingdom of heaven is something that God does in us that transforms us from being just people to being sons and daughters of God. And John is saying, the kingdom of heaven is near. And guess who dwells in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? God dwells there, yes. But according to John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 14, we are told that the Word, Jesus, the Word became flesh, and tabernacled, dwelt among us. Jesus came to dwell in us, to make in us the kingdom of heaven. So the arrival of Jesus and his mission is to put the kingdom of heaven into our lives through our relationship with him. You may not have thought there was all that much in that short little bit there. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John is saying the one who's going to take you from being a citizen to being in a relationship with God, that person who's going to tabernacle and dwell with us is near. And so you need to change your thinking. You can no longer think everything is fine. I know exactly where I'm going. I know the assurance of being a child of Abraham or a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church or any Christian church. It is not that. It is the relationship with God made possible through the person of Jesus, the person who was God with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Maybe now I won't be coughing at you. Sorry about that. Now I'll knock that off. <laughs> there, now it's safe. We need to change are thinking. Now, let's look at the text again. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothing was made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. Don't worry about how scratchy that would be. Yeah, it would. He probably had a softer undergarment because uh, camel's hair would probably drive you crazy with scratching all the time. But it was simple clothing. He wasn't buying his suits handmade at Savile Row. He was wearing poor person clothes. And he had a strange diet. His food was locust and wild honey. Now, there are some people who will try to persuade you that John was a vegetarian and he was eating pods from the locust tree. Uh, no, he wasn't. 
You could not be a vegetarian and be a Jew. You had to eat lamb at Passover. John wasn't a vegetarian, neither was Daniel. That's revisionist thinking. Being a vegetarian is fine. It's, it's admirable in our day, but let's not superimpose what we think back on people of biblical times. He ate hopping things, locusts. And by the way, if you read the scriptures, Deuteronomy 14, Leviticus 11, they are, in fact, clean. Whether you would choose to eat them is entirely up to you, but they are clean meat. And I heard on NPR once a number of years ago that there is 16 times more protein per ounce in grasshopper, a relative of the locust, than in beef. So... You don't need a pound of beef. You can eat an ounce of grasshopper and get the same amount of protein. Uh, I'll get mine from beans, I think. I'd, I'd have a hard time eating bugs. But they're clean. So John had a wilderness diet and simple dress. That's all that that means. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now we need to understand sin and confession. Confession is easy. Confession is merely agreeing that God knows the true condition of our lives. We're just telling God what God already knows. It's not a surprise. You can't sneak up on God and say, surprise, God knows everything. So God knows that we're sinners. So when we confess, we're not putting new information in God's hands. We are just acknowledging our condition, which is, by the way, the first step in 12-step recovery. You have to, first of all, own your condition. You have to acknowledge, I am a sinner. So what is it to sin? What is sin? We're not going to take time to look these things up because I understand that you like to be out of here early and I'm looking at the clock and it's fast approaching the amen horn, so I'm going to speed along. I'm just going to tell you, in Romans 6.23, we know that the wages of sin is death, Right? But I do want to read this to you from 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through verse 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, these things which were not to love, okay? For everything in the world, <clears throat> the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. It's sin, these things that he's just mentioned. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. God loved the world so much he gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish. So sin is a condition of the mind, or we often say the heart, that embraces otherness from God. Otherness. How else do you say that? Now, still in 1 John, in the next chapter, chapter 3 and verse 4, a verse that we have often misapplied, everyone who sins breaks the law. Now, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, however you're used to hearing that. What does it say? It says the person who has sin in their life shows that sinfulness because they break the law. 
The law is there to inform us of the true condition in our minds and our hearts. No wonder John says you have to change your thinking. It's not about what you do and what you don't do. What you do is an indication of your relationship with God. If you follow God, your behavior shows that. If you're thinking of yourself, your behavior shows that. And the purpose of the law is to be a mirror. Paul calls it in Galatians, a schoolmaster, a teacher, to show us the true condition of our hearts because we need to change our thinking. That's what repentance is. We have to be aware of our condition. We need to repent. Now, you might say to me, but Galatians 2 and verse 8 says, for it is by grace that we're saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm not talking about works. I'm not trying to say to you, you need to behave in a certain way in order to reach heaven. No. Your behavior is not what God measures. Your behavior is an indication to you of the true condition of your life. God's not judging your behavior. God is judging the condition of your relationship with him. Because God knows that. God knows how we think. God knows our desires. But we cannot be honest with ourselves. Therefore, we need some measurement by which we can tell the true condition of our lives. So now, John tells the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who are boasting over their relationship to Abraham, we are the children of Abraham. The children of Abraham are we. He says, now, you need to produce fruit of repentance. There needs to be evidence that you have truly altered your thinking. Now, what did he say? What, what is this of repentance? The fruit of repentance. Now, this will be the last passage I'm going to have you turn to, those of you who are clock watchers. I'm almost done. Galatians chapter 5. So turn to Galatians chapter 5 in your Bible or on your electronic device, whatever you choose to use. But I want you to see this. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 19, because verse 19 through 21 shows us what the law reveals about us. What are we like before the grace of God changes us? What is our natural, innate behavior? Chapter 5, starting in verse 19. The acts of the sinful nature, or the carnal nature, the nature of the flesh, your relationship before your relationship with God. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And he lists several. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, uh, drunkenness, I guess, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. I've seen some church board meetings where there's a considerable amount of that. I'm sure that doesn't exist here. But it, I've seen places where it occurs. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, political factoring, that kind of stuff. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? 
because it is the unrepentant character of mankind. It is our natural behavior before we change our thinking and accept the grace of Jesus Christ. But when we do that, I want you to notice what comes next in verse 22, and I want you to notice what in my Bible is the third word, the third word, but the fruit of the Spirit. John says, I want you to have the fruit of repentance. If your mind has literally been changed by Christ in you, this is what you will be like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see that? It, the law is pointing out that before we change our thinking and allow Jesus to dwell in us, in order for the kingdom of heaven to be in us, we have to change our thinking from what we were like before that to what we are like when Christ dwells or tabernacles in us. And when Christ is in us, surprise, our behavior is different. But you see, the fallacy that John was addressing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees is your thinking, <coughs> because of my relationship to Abraham, or let's make it current, because of my membership in the church, I'm not a sinner. If that's your thinking, it needs to change. Because we need the kingdom of heaven in us, Jesus. Because when Jesus truly is in our hearts and truly in our minds, our behavior changes. If we're concentrating on our behavior, we're going to miss the boat. We're not going to even be at the dock. We cannot focus on behavior. Because when we're focusing on behavior, we're focusing on the problem, not the solution. And in my growing up time, and the people who taught me, bless their hearts, they thought they were doing right, but they weren't. They were teaching that it's all about my behavior. I'm glad that I learned from Morris Venden and others that it's not about my behavior, it's about my relationship with Jesus. Don't struggle to change your behavior. Change your thinking and say, I choose to let Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwell in me. And when I make that choice, my, cha my behavior changes from all the things we read in, in, in uh, Galatians 5, 17 through 21, it changes from that to all of the things we read in verses 22 and 20, or 23 and 24, 22 and 23, sorry. Behavior changes when our thinking changes. So John says you need to repent, which means you need to change your thinking. Quit focusing on the things that are wrong in your life and focus instead on the solution to your problem. The solution to your problem is not trying harder. That doesn't work. Maybe you've discovered that. Maybe you're so discouraged with your behavior that you think, what's the use? I might as well live as a sinner. If this life is all I'm going to get, I might as well grab all the gusto I can find. It's not about your behavior. It's about your choice. And if you are continually choosing to allow Jesus to dwell in you, your behavior will change. Because when Jesus is in you, 
you act like Jesus. And when your selfishness has pushed him out, you act like the devil. So do I. And so if my behavior is making me embarrassed and discouraged, what does that tell me? My thinking is messed up. My choices are misaligned. So what was John's message? Change your thinking because the kingdom of God is near. It ought to be as near as your own heart and mind. And when Jesus comes, we will be transformed from just the relationship part of the kingdom to the citizenship part with the Lord forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the teaching of John the Baptist. May his words slap us until we realize that our thinking has been wrong. And may we invite Jesus into our hearts now and always. Through our wonderful Savior, we thank you. Amen.